I just gotta say, you gotta love any cartoonist who offers his, uh, on his first major, uh, uh, kind of massive uh, self-authored and uh, totally uh, his own graphic novel. This is his author self-portrait. And also, um, this is how he'll willingly present himself on the internet. Uh, um, he gave me permission, so. That's, uh, um, uh, so, uh, I thought we could just get started talking a little bit, just kind of walk through your career. One of the things I, I've just kind of you know, blown away, I was telling you before, I've been kind of following your career for the last 10 years or so, which is you know, about your career, I mean, that's about it. And it's been just remarkable watching your development and watching uh, the kind of, uh, the, uh, kind of your, your reputation kind of find more and more readers over time. But one of the things I was struck by early on was I mean, even when you were really young, the very beginning of your career, uh, you had a really mature style. You had, a, you had your own style already, the kind of style that I think a lot of cartoonists I study and, and, and talk with, it takes them into well into their 30s to really find. So, you know, I know kind of a little bit about your kind of background growing up with comics and drawing, but could you just talk a little bit about kind of how you trained yourself, how you came to your style, and what your, some of your influences were on your early work? Sure. Um, when I was doing my, my first comics and putting my strips out there, um, I started to get feedback from uh, different cartoonists who, who, like, I would send them the comics. And I, I didn't give much of an introductory statement to them about who I was and how old I was and things like that. And you I just really, drop them in the mail? Yeah, you know, like, this is before uh, many people have websites or anything like that, so you would look at the letters column of, uh, you know, underground right. comics or whatever yeah. and, and look at... See, you know, take a look at the indicia and see who published the work. Right. And you could send, you know, care of Dan Klaus, yeah. you know, Fanographics, blah blah blah. Um, and they started to respond like, "Are you uh, an old burnout? <laughs> like, like we, we never, we never saw you. Are you work some before. strange veteran of the underground scene? Right. We never some, heard some like obscure guy. Who, like there, there's." Uh, you know, if you really look deep into those old comics, there are droves of just guys who were like one-hitter quitters. Yeah. They would put oh, out yeah. one book and, and uh, kind of disappear yeah. from the scene. Um, so I guess like my style, like my earliest uh, inspirations were, um, you know, guys like Robert Crumb. Uh, I saw that there's this documentary, really great one, called Comic Book Confidential. And uh, like... Like ninety percent of my earliest influences come directly from that flick. So they're speaking with people like uh, Jaime Hernandez and uh, Will Eisner, Harvey Kurtzman, and there's like there's a pretty healthy section of underground stuff too. Yeah. So I get to see Robert Crumb, uh, Gilbert Shelton, those guys, and uh, it was important to check out the underground comics part of that documentary because uh, there was like this one single image where Crumb is talking about the evolution of the Fritz the Cat character. Right. And they put this single image up that you can see is very clearly done on, no, on notebook paper, lined notebook right. paper, drawn in pencil. So that made it feel like such a tangible thing, like, like so lo-fi. Like, like I the have, kind of things in your notebook? I have, well, right. it inspired me to like draw in a notebook, yeah. right? Like, like it's like I have a notebook and I have a pencil, like so there's like what's stopping you. and. Um, you know, then, then like the very next day after I saw that on television, there was this, uh, you know, went to the library to just like try to find any books about comics, and there was this, uh, this um, book called Comics by Les Daniels from, from yeah. the 70s. Yeah. Uh, it's not so well known. No. Um, probably, like, yeah, I don't know. He's better known for his Superman history. Yeah, yeah. I, guess, I guess some of the stuff in there was uh, like, might be dubious, like like it's not all completely. I, I yeah. forget. There's there's a reason why it's not completely well known. But they had full stories of, you know, they it elaborated on everything that was being said in that comic book confidential uh, documentary. So there were whole chapters in this book that had complete stories from Robert Crumb, from Kim Deitch, guys like Jay Lynch, Spain Rodriguez. Um, and, you know, the old uh, E.C. Hort, like, just like all this stuff. It opened up my mind because I'm like the last vestige of kids who were able to go to the grocery store with mom and dad, and there would be five spinner racks. And there'd be comics. You're right. Yeah. And, and, you know, like, that's like how I got my comics until I was like, you know, eight or nine, ten years old. And then to be introduced <laughs> to the, like, this wider ecosystem of, of comics yeah. culture. It but was, it's how awesome that you actually started writing them and seeking them out as a, 
you know, as a punk kid. Yeah. Uh, that's, I mean, that's, and they started writing back. Is that how you kind of started collaborating with Jay Lynch? Yeah, 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 very uh, much so. Like, like his. That's, yeah, that's one of your collaborations with him that ended up in Mineshaft. Uh. Yeah, his, his work uh, was in that comics by Les Daniels book, and there were a couple really great strips, and he, he hasn't done that much comics work over, no, over the so years. It's, his stuff is very labor intensive and very cool, and, and the reason why we collaborated, he had these very tight roughs that he couldn't imagine taking the time to produce the final pieces. And you know, I was 21 when I did this stuff here, so it's like even hard to look at. And, and his- That's hard to look at? His, his, like if you would see his roughs, they're, they're perfectly uh, publishable. And, but but I, was happy, I was still happy to- You were like, sure, I'll take your roughs. It was exactly that. Yeah. It was exactly that. And I'm like, yeah, I mean, sure, like, like I'll do it, but his stuff was perfectly publishable. These, these are great. I mean, these are um, uh, kind of, autobiographical comics uh, by Jane Lynch, one of the great pioneers, I think underappreciated pioneers of underground comics, um, and uh, even by people who kind of grew up in that generation, so that you were, you have a historical instinct from the start to know who the people were that you should be seeking out. I mean, you see this in your later work, too. Yeah, like, I, and I, I, I'm not gonna front on anybody, like, I grew, I loved Rob Liefeld and Todd McFarlane and and kind of, kind of guys who are considered to be a little bit more, more silly or whatever, but, you know, really spoke to uh, kids, uh, kids my age, I'm not the only right. one, they sold millions yeah. of books, like literally yeah. millions of comics. But, so when I would read interviews with my heroes, Rob, Rob Liefeld and McFarlane, and they kind of had all the same cliche statements and platitudes where they would talk about, you know, it's important, like, what, like they have these influences, and like, they, they would say they don't want to be derivative, but I mean, they just look right. like Michael Golden or Arnett, right. but like, we don't want to be derivative. So like, I started to beat into my head, right. like, I should I should look for the pioneers as opposed to just copying, you know, people who are kind of contemporary on the scene or something. Well, we'll we'll come back to this because one of the things that runs through all your work as a writer is clearly you're drawn to the kind of pioneers, uh, folks who are trying to do new things within established form. We'll come back to that with some of your other work as well. But I wanted to just bounce back for a second. So when did you start doing some of your early kind of mini comics work and your diary comics, which you were doing in? In isolation chamber. Okay, so like the stuff for, for Deviant Funnies, uh, it's just a collection of very small strips that I did. And, uh, you know, in say early 2000s and, and before then, there were, um, you know, you would submit to different publishers that might have like little anthology uh, series or something right. like that. So the idea for me was to maybe try to get a couple of short strips published. Um, and there were maybe, you know, five gatekeepers with who you could send work to, you know, Fantagraphics and Slave Labor, Drawing Quarterly, a couple others, Top Shelf. Uh, so what I would do is I would, you know, spend a couple of weeks uh, putting together a strip, send, send it off to, you know, these five or six different places, and then, you know, routinely get my rejections back. And I felt a little bit weird about just, like, kind of working on this stuff so much and just throwing it in the closet and, and just, like, considering it, like, like failed to work, so the work that's in this Deviant Funny is mini comic, and I just I just printed them up on, on you know typing paper on a Xerox machine and folded over and staple it. Um, but the work in there comprises the stuff that I sent to the different cartoonists who I adored, including uh, Harvey Pekar and Jay Lynch. Like the idea was, okay, I'm going to send these cool cartoonists who I respect this work and maybe get some cool feedback. Yeah. You know, to try to figure out, like, what, like, what can I do? I was so dead. I've always been dead set on, on doing comics. Like, there's, there's, there's never been a plan B. So I had to just, I had to figure certain things out, and um, you know, put together this mini comic, and I would just send, send it to anybody whose address I could find, and then, that's when Jay Lynch first got in touch, and, uh, and then I got a call from Harvey P. Carr, like right, right while you have a a great uh, uh, page of uh, your uh, recount. Was, was the conversation really like this? You didn't it, really, it, was it, it really was because it was, it was kind of like, it was a meta experience in a way because at, at the point where Harvey called the house, American Splendor was never more popular. You right. know, the flick won the grand prize at Sundance and the movie was fresh out in wide release. Like I saw the movie with some friends like the week before and uh, so then Harvey calls the house, he, he, and then, like after we saw the flick, you know, I have his friend who could kind of like talk all raspy voice, right? and stuff. So, and and 
Like, I was just thinking, like, man, if, if this is you, dude, like, this is, like, the most vicious joke you could ever play. Like, like we've, we've been friends for years and years, and we never, like, prank each other. Like, we're not, like, frat boys, you know? Like, I'm, I'm not going to, like, give you a wedgie. Like, so why would you do that? Well, my favorite is when you're like, I can't believe it's you. And he's like, what do you mean you can't believe it's me? You keep sending me stuff. Yeah, yeah but, you know, it, um, the way I got his address, too, there was a Dark Horse uh, comic uh, that mm -hmm. the cover was... was uh, Designed like a like a Time Magazine Man of the Year yeah, cover. You remember that? Mm -hmm. So it's a photograph of him, right? And with the address, with the, the address, address on the cover. That's how I got the address. And, and that I was, was actually his address. That's his address. Yeah. I, I didn't, like <laughs> it, it. Never got sent back. So you just kept sending. I just kept sending. Wow. Yeah, like, was, yeah. <laughs> so lessons in here for you young people. Here. That's a, that's, that's you, a, you'll find like a million people way more talented than me, but but like the discipline. Like I I can say that like I have a certain discipline and just like. I just don't put up with no, you know, and, and like that's served me well like throughout, yeah, throughout well, the years. And as you said, you knew this is what you wanted to do and you and you went after it. And there there it's not like there are other they're kind of part of the joy of comics, right, is that there's not a kind of clear professional pathway. So you gotta you gotta find your own It's also also like a big source of nervousness because there is no textbook, right. so you have to like kind of figure out your way. But I mean that's like quality problems, you know what I mean? Like yeah. you get your foot in the door and then it's like, now what the hell do I do? Like like like, you know, there's no template. Well, and getting getting hired by Harvey Picar means you're going to be doing a lot of work really fast, right? He had you on the Our Movie Year. Our Movie Year was, um, I think I have a, yeah, yeah this was the, um, uh, it was a kind of collection of uh, stories based on his, uh, Harvey's and Joyce's experiences during the making of the movie and after the release of the movie, wrestling with some of the, the issues that came up. And you got originally kind of asked just to do a short story and then ended up doing a lot more, right? Is that right? Yeah, um, this, this is a page from uh, a four-pager, which was the initial thing that Harvey invited me to do. Um, and this is the manifestation out of a year's worth of hanging with the guy, kind of. Like, like, he called me after the flick, and it was a whole year before we set, work, set to work on this comic. And... You know, at that early stage, he wanted to see every sort of step of, my, of production, which kind of slowed things down, which meant that, you know, like, couldn't really trust me with the bigger work because there was, uh, uh, he doesn't use, e he didn't use email, you know, right. so there's a lot of USPS work involved in the whole production process. And, and uh, you know, he, was, he would joke, he was just like, yeah, you know, really, I, tr I trust you, but I just got to make sure you don't draw me with, like, uh, in underwear with, like, a cape or something <laughs> like that. So, so we did this four-page comic, and, and uh, I was like, okay, cool, I, I worked with Harvey, like, it's done, and I just forgot about things for a while, I'm like, okay, well, I got a taste, now I have to, now I want to try to figure out how to kind of parlay this, or, or get some extra work, maybe, like, having this, this kind of credit can, like, lead to yeah. something else, and then he called me again, and I guess he was contractually ob obligated to, uh, set, uh, like, have the Our Movie Yearbook be a certain a page length, and they were 25 pages short at the very end of the deadline. So he calls me up, and it's it's like days before my birthday, uh, and I you know I'm making all these plans and stuff, and he's like, okay man, do you want to do a lot of pages in a very very short amount of time? And I was like, yeah, you know, I'll put my birthday on hiatus, whatever. Uh, and it was like a 24, 25 page story that I had to do in like 28 days, and and uh, you know like just for. As you guys will see if you if you take a look like whenever we <coughs> drop over to the to the to the space like the the artwork's done on like 11 by 17 pieces of paper um, there's a lot of what they call pencil mileage involved uh, in the process it's just like pretty labor intensive stuff yeah. so like I had um, I never had an anxiety anxiety attack before doing that but I like I certainly had one I pulled like three all-nighters didn't step out of the house for like a month yeah. uh, but it was it was a kind of a cartoonist boot camp. I felt, I felt like he, it, to some extent, he was testing me because, like I said, American Splendor was never more popular than it was right at that moment, which also meant that Harvey got a lot of work uh, as a result right. of being in the movie and a lot of work like that was like uh, given to him on a handshake where he didn't have to submit anything. So they were like, yes, we want to put out a book of yours, whatever you want it to be. So he just said yes to everything, <laughs> and then. You know, like like found artists to do 
the different books that came out that year or two. And was he a good, I mean, as a, uh, as a kind of, as you were sending him stuff in, in process, was, I mean, you, you described it as a kind of boot camp, was he also a good teacher? I mean, did he have good suggestions about that? Uh, you know what, he was, he was super lax, and, yeah. and, and, and he, and... Um, so he wanted to see it, but he wasn't right. riding you. Like, he literally wanted to make sure that I didn't put Mickey Mouse ears on him or something. I mean, yeah. like, it was something that yeah. crazy. Did you ever see, there was that old uh, Ed the Happy Clown oh, yeah. uh, trade paperback, like the first one, yeah. where it, there's an introduction by, uh, written by Harvey. Uh, that's no. dra it's drawn by Chester Brown, and Chester Brown draws him like a rabbit. It's so weird. And he didn't and it's, and it's out of Harvey's voice. No, I think he's fine with it, but, but it was just, <laughs> you know, I, uh, maybe, he, maybe that rubbed yeah. off or something. <laughs> um, yeah. And then he comes back to you like, Almost like how long afterwards before he came back to you about doing Macedonia? Turned in, turned in the work for uh, that 25-page comic, and almost immediately he's like, "Oh, cool, awesome, good. Do you want to do? Do you?" He, he he posed it like this. He's like, "Do you want to do a comic book called called Macedonia?" And I was excited because I'm like, you know, Alexander the Great. <laughs> <laughs> You know, like, yeah. like we're going to do a graphic novel right. about this guy taking over the world. And, like, I always loved that, uh, that uh, philosopher, uh, uh, Diogenes. Like, like, like yeah. how cool would it be, the, the creator of the school of cynicism or whatever? Like, you, you didn't know you were doing an academic dissertation. About the geopolitical destabilization of the Balkan region and yeah. its implications on the people? Yeah. Nah. Now I got <laughs> It's uh, for, for those of you guys who haven't read, I mean, and this is a, talk about a tough gig. I mean, it was a dissertation. I mean, he basically had to adapt a dissertation into a comic. And it reads like it. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's text heavy. I mean, you did an amazing job opening that thing up, but it must have been brutal. Yeah, I, I mean, there was no way I was going to say no, but um, it was tough. And it, it probably should have been a 300-page yeah. comic because you could see, I mean, there are, there are pages that have even more panels than this, and there's no room for, to, 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 to kind of shine with the imagery. It's all conversations, and the first 15 pages of this book, it's one conversation that takes place between uh, the, the female, the, the protagonist, uh, Heather Roberson, and her boyfriend, just about her interest in going to the Balkan. Right. A, and it's a 13-page conversation the, and, and if you've ever seen the American Splendor flick, like his scripts are just little stick figures and, you know, I, it's like hieroglyphics um, and I very quickly like learned, okay, the female characters are the little stick figures with the little triangle on the head. Like the triangle <laughs> means hair. Um, so that was all that I was given and, and uh, for, for that whole sequence. So the way that I drew it, she like, she gets off a train and he meets her at the train station. They're right. driving you have home. To move into space. Yeah. They're move, they're driving home. They eat dinner. They're finished with dinner and washing up. Like I, I couldn't figure out how to make that sequence the least bit interesting. It, 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 just just for myself to draw and for a reader, I'm trying to imagine what a reader would do. It was it was, it was yeah. very tough. But, but it also seems to me like I mean this was I mean I, I mean I, I can I, as I said I can only imagine it's a tough gig. And there are times reading it you can feel like you're really struggling trying to figure out how to make this, this fairly dry academic stuff kind of come alive on the page. And you do an amazing job, but I also think that challenge of doing that must have been good for you as you started working towards longer uh, kind of full-length book projects. I think, I think Macedonia, like, like that's, that's why, where comics really became an addiction. It, it was something that I, that I always did, um, but I, <laughs> I could also do other things to have fun as well, right. right? But like this was a 14 month tour of duty uh, that, that um, when I was finished, like I honestly didn't want to do anything but comics, but it's, it, it gave me the, the kickstart to do my own thing because I'm like, right. yeah, this was, like I saw um, things that I would have done editorially like with this, but it's like, you can't, Harvey Picard's a legend, you know, you don't, you don't mess with a legend's work in, in any other way. Like, I wouldn't even make a suggestion of any changes, you know what I mean? It was just so cool to work with the guy. Yeah, and it's, you know, I mean, if at the end of doing something like, like you know, adapting a, uh, a, a dissertation on the geopolitical destabilization of the Balkans into comics, you're going to know if you want to do comics or not, right? If you still love it after that, you're, you're in it for life. Um, and it was kind of 
you did one more big project with with Harvey, and that was the Beats. Right. Um, and I noticed that the Beats, you, your style. I mean, partly just because you had more page space to work with. You, you start. You did this after Macedonia, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, and I noticed your style is is. I mean, you have much more fun with the panels, much more fun with the page. Was this a, a more fun project to work on in terms of the visual storytelling side of it? Uh, it was. Things were opened up a little bit more. Um, just a little bit more of a, like a sex, drugs, rock and roll vibe to the yeah. whole thing that, that like I kind of dug. Um, and I, I really didn't and I don't want uh, every project to kind of just look the same. So I was, still, I was just playing with things. I learned a lot, you know, the, like in those earlier days, I mean, uh, all, of, all of the files for Macedonia and everything, they were, they were still assembled digitally. Right. But you really don't know the entire process until you see your work in print, see how it translates, you know, see like what like the line widths of your crosshatch, yeah. like what's acceptable, what's not, like does did you get the exact gray that you wanted uh, when it was reduced? And well, there's that actually that conversation in the Chester Gould piece where Jay Lynch and Harvey are talking with Chester Gould about you know and he's complaining how he can't do cross hatching anymore because of the ink bleed, right? Right, so, yeah, you know, and the cheapness of paper and, right. and, and the and the shrinking real estate is at that stage. Yeah, so so a, a big part of comics really is this back end production stuff. Um, so with the first stuff I did, that our movie yearbook, they just I sent them Xeroxes because I didn't even know how to use Photoshop. Right. Um, and then I hated the results. I hated the way that the final printed book looked. So it's like, okay, I need to be the master of my own destiny in this way. I need to I need to figure out how to assemble these pages digitally though, to give them to print so that right. it doesn't embarrass me so much. So uh, you know. So you learn more of the stages of of, the, yeah. of production and post production. <laughs> yeah. So I use like some grayscale right. on these pages, and uh, you know I just wanted to see like how that translated on the the pretty standard paper that um, was was used. You know, just just kind of for my own reference and. Um, yeah. And it was, I mean, we'll come, we'll come, I mean, one of the things that's kind of fascinating to me as somebody who loves nonfiction comics um, is, you know, I mean, you did, uh, you did a lot of autobiographical comics, a few um, kind of more kind of uh, short stories and kind of dream uh, stuff in, um, the, in the Deviant comics, but a lot of your stuff was autobiographical or nonfiction comics at the start of your career. Um, and of course, you're working with Hip Hop Family Tree now, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, and kind of thinking about that as you started to turn towards your first piece of kind of full-length fiction, WYSIWYG, which is the best book cover design of the last decade. Yeah, right. Especially for those of us who had the, you know, the original <laughs> old Max there. Um, the, um, I mean, this WYSIWYG is, on one hand, it's a work of fiction. On the other hand, there's a, there's a lot of historical research in here, too, right? So yeah. it's, uh, it tells, for those of you guys who haven't read it yet, it tells the story of um, of Kevin, uh, whose hacker name is, is Boing Thump, um, and he's really a kind of composite, right, of, right. of a, a whole bunch of, of different guys. And you started doing this before you sold it to Top Shelf. You were doing this, sure. I remember seeing it in, in kind of mini comics, like self-published, right? Yeah. And by that point, you were really, had kind of mastered all sides of it, because it looked Ooh, I good. Never, I would never say mastered by well, any It means. looked good in, in your self-published versions. I remember thinking, this looks good for self-published works. Yeah, thanks. Like the, whole, the whole trajectory of, the, of WYSIWYG kind of hit almost every available uh, 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 what would you, uh, sort of medium like within comics. So like, it started out as mini comics, just on a Xerox machine, and uh, I did three volumes of this self-published kind right. of square format print-on-demand, uh, uh, you know, these print-on-demand volumes, and and those things actually sold kind of great. Like it was it was kind of shocking, you know. Um, but as I was doing them, because this is a very long, sprawling project, it took me like five years, and I always wanted to draw comics, um, and I never focused on the writing too much when I was younger. And as any of you guys. Uh, have experienced if you're, you're into doing creative things. Um, when you were young, like you would have these exponential increases in ability really rapidly, like within like a two or three year span when you're in high school, like you can get like the jump in quality can be really huge. Right. And uh, as I was writing this long 
story, I felt that way about my writing. And I'm not saying the writing is good or great or anything like that, but, but it improved so much from the time that I started doing the self-published books that um, I was able to put three volumes of these guys out. And I had this really uh, almost like religious, re religious uh, trip that I was invited to, uh, to go to an arts festival in Copenhagen, Denmark. And, and it, uh, the American cartoonists who were represented there was Dan Klaus, uh, Charles Burns, Chris Ware, and myself. So if you're familiar with these guys, <laughs> It's like the three greatest American cartoonists working today, and you know my silly ass because in uh, Scandinavia apparently there's like a pretty respectable uh, hacker community, and I no. and it wasn't lost. Like every copy that of these books that was out there like passed through my hands, and so so I was sending a ton of books out, you know, to, to that Finland. region, <laughs> yeah, to to. Uh, to political like building like like a, the government officials were buying this by by like wow. it, that was the weirdest like set of packages they bought like six of each wow. and it was the day after I was on this radio show talking about how I figured out how to uh, create a false identity in a uh, in, a, in America. All the instructions how to do it in there I, if I ever need it now it's there it's in here like so. like two weeks ago uh, there was an article out that said uh, um, now that the digital version uh, is available. Um, Worldwide, WYSIWYG is number two in China. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, I think you you, uh, you you may not get any invitations to uh, speak at any conventions in China. Yeah, but just real quick, um, um, after going to Denmark, the reason I even brought it up is because sitting there uh, at the, it, it was just an information gathering uh, symposium. It wasn't about the commerce of like an American comic convention where you go there and you sit behind a table and and uh, people buy your books or whatever. It was all about sharing information. So I got to sit in and, and they scheduled everything great so that you didn't miss, like there wasn't a Charles Burns talk going on when a Chris Ware talk right. was going on. So I was able to catch all of those and I, I, I didn't sleep almost that entire trip. So, so I'm kind of high on, on lack of sleep and I'm just absorbing their information and, and there's, there are all these similarities between everything that these three heroes of mine were saying, so it juiced me up. I got really excited, and I went back and I rewrote all of this. Like, like I was going to start working on volume four, and that was going to be it. But I already, like when I was out there, I was like looking at my original volumes, just like, ah, oh, these really aren't that great. So I rewrote everything, redrew some panels, and then, and then completed the story so that it all has kind of a similar voice, yeah. you know, not, not like... You know, the voice is like this like 23-year-old who didn't know what the heck he was doing. And can, can I just ask you a quick question? Was working with Top Shelf a good experience? Yeah, I think, I think the scheme that I'm going to uh, use from now on is to just <coughs> do a complete book. And then go to... Yeah, because then there's no editorial right. interference. Like, like the editorial interference that I get is because I did... Um, I was very delinquent, like negligent in English class. So I don't know how to use commas properly, and and uh, you know, my misspelling. That's what computers are for. They tell me where to put the code. Yeah, I'm, I'm uh, so so. Uh, yeah, they they help me with that stuff basically, and and uh, that's pretty much it. And and I mean, this is a just a gorgeous. I mean, I know I'm, we shouldn't be just judging books by its cover, but that is just an awesome cover. Was that your your baby? Oh, it was. It was. That's um, great. the. Uh, the, like I had ideas for the design and the format of the book, like, like these, these self-published books, um, they would have like four panels per page. The mini comics I did had uh, six panels per page and the kind of proposal book that I sent to the various publishers had actually 12 panels per page. Like the format of this stuff was very malleable and the reason for that was that um, I wanted to just, I didn't want to, uh, I, I wanted to be, um, accepting of whatever they thought would be kind of maybe cheapest, like they're, you know, this is my first solo book, so right. I, I wanted to just have have the publisher in mind so that they can just kind of manipulate the page to whatever page count that kind of, they kind of wanted. So in we my learned mind, those lessons from Harvey and our movie here. <laughs> you don't want to get stuck writing 25 pages in 20 days. Sure, <laughs> sure, sure. So, so if the my thought was if the book was going to be six panels a page, <laughs> essentially like this was, then that's if we do it like 
you know, six by nine, that's about the dimensions, like the scale of the, these old uh, Macintosh, like 1984 Macintoshes. And if, it, if we were going to do it uh, in the standard, like the self-published books, four panels per page, that would have been a, uh, it would have been a square, and that would have been probably like, it would have been over 400 pages, and I was going to design it to look like a phone book, you know, because it's, like, it's like the thickness of a phone book. And a big part of computer hacking is the phone it's aspect. The phone freaking, yes, and that's kind of actually where, where the story begins with, for, for those of you guys who are too young to remember, you know, Steve Jobs, Wozniak, a lot of the guys who became the kind of pioneers in computers, but also in hacking culture, began as freakers, spelled P-H, um, I remember. Back in the day, um, uh, having the, what was it, the blue box? Was that what it's called? Yeah. Um, can I just ask you a quick question? This is Kevin. This is our, our, um, our hero uh, or protagonist. I think he's a hero. Um, well, I want to talk to you about your feelings about him uh, as well. But I want to just ask you a couple questions about the character design. Because it's, uh, you drew him in a way that kind of emphasized, you know, what we might call the kind of more cartoony or kind of iconic features. The, the pupilless eyes, the big head and the big hair, especially in the beginning, right. before he kind of grows up um, and matures somewhat. Um, kind of what, what was your thinking behind that design? Um, the aesthetic? Um, so yeah. so the, the hair design of like his younger self, there was, uh, there's a famous hacker named Kevin Polson, and uh, as, as I was reading more and more about the, the culture, I saw this photograph of Kevin Polson sitting there amongst like, he had all these phones from different eras, and he has a big ass poof, Kind of, kind of, like he had that hair, and it was like, oh, that's so hysterical. And and there's that old adage when creating uh, characters in animation, like the most successful. And you could think about this, like the most successful characters, uh, you could identify by their silhouettes. And um, with that crazy, ridiculous hair, like yeah. like if you saw him on a, like a front view, like it's like more indicative of like the, how ridiculous the hair cut it cut is, uh, and. So that was the inspiration for that. The, the blank eyes was, were something that I wanted to do, to do from the get-go because he's the only character in the entire book who, uh, who has eyes like that. And that was essential for um, the later part when the character's a fugitive and he's adopting different right. personas. So you could keep track of him. Right, yeah, yeah. you could just draw uh, any kind of weird-looking guy you want, but as long as, like, you know, you... You read 300, uh, you know, uh, 150 pages of the book before we get to that point, so you completely identify those blank eyes with this character. Yeah. Here he is, in a, you know, with different hair, he's on the run. And this is where uh, Ed is giving you very explicit instructions for how to adopt a fake identity if you need to. Although you do say, I wouldn't do this unless you're desperate. You said, like the little, did your lawyer instruct you to put that in there? Going to these hacker conventions and things, like these kids, like, they really, like, they test the limits of yeah. legality and so, and so I've been heartbroken several times, even, uh, this guy, this guy who, um, you know, it, it might be kind of a fringe thing, but there is this dude named Aaron Schwartz who, who uh, oh, yeah. was a co-creator of Reddit, or maybe right. he was the creator. Like, like, I met him before, and he's just a kid. He's way younger than me. Um, and he went through this whole thing, and the, the feds were interested in him, and, and they had a, a legal case against him. And he didn't do anything very wrong in, in you know, my opinion, or almost anybody else's opinion. Um, and he was going to. He downloaded a lot of documents. Right. right. He he downloaded loaded documents that were um, that and he, he made them pu he like he he made them public, so the government could get couldn't get like the ten cents per page or something that right. like a, you or I would have had to pay to get these documents. And he made them available, but you can't copyright law, so like those those are not copyrightable. It, it, there's all, all these issues. Yeah. The, the poor guy killed himself, and uh, and and and. I've seen other instances where guys just play around and do silly stuff and they end up in trouble and it breaks my heart because they're really nice people, they're sweet people and I'm seeing it like they're going to be screwed, you right. know, like they're a part of the system now. So I just put that there because I didn't, I didn't want people to, to really do, and I met guys who, who just played cat and mouse, like I met this, this guy who's a, who's a private investigator and uh, he, he was kind of a, a, a right wing kind of guy and uh, he, there was this, this writer within the, the hacker world who, um, more left-leaning, obviously, and both of those guys decided to have a wager against each other. Um, the private eye, basically, he has his whole thesis about privacy is dead, and, and he goes around talking about it, like, I could find you anywhere in the world, blah, 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 and he was, like, right. was boasting about that, and this writer was like, okay, man, I'm, let's, let's, let's put a wager up, and, and it, this is during the McCain 
the McCain uh, Obama right. election, and they were like, okay, I'm going, you know, I'm the left leaning writer guy. I'm going to the disappear around the world, and like, if you can find me, uh, then I will, I'll vote for McCain, <laughs> and and vice versa. And he was actually found really fast. Uh, and so they were just like, well, how about like best of best of five? I feel like you know, best. Of, and so they did it. And the last time he, he was found, uh, the private investigator found him under a false name in Belize, and uh, and sent like a, like a like a you know one one of those uh, florist services like to to his house like with a little letter like ah, I found you. So what I'm saying is these guys like were playing around yeah. with like fake IDs and in in this post 9/11 world like yeah. they're brazen and they have balls, but. But, uh, well, that's what I, mean, I wanted to ask you about that because one of the things I love about the book, and I, and I, I think it's, it's a masterpiece, one of the best graphic novels of, of the last decade. Uh, one of the things I really liked about it is that it's, you know, you're absolutely indicting the demonization of hackers, right? I mean, that's clear. But that's about as didactic as you let yourself get. Uh, so you have this character who's this kind of rabid, self-promoting journalist who's, you know, trying to build up his own career by demonizing hackers, and you have him come to a, a really Kind of gross and awesome ending, but but in terms of the hacking community, you really you're really careful. To, I mean, on one hand, you you don't glamorize or even necessarily make a hero out of out of Kevin, right? I mean, he is he's a complex character. His motivations are a mixture of kind of curiosity and hubris and and immaturity and you know all kinds of stuff. And you you kind of don't really pass judgment on him kind of either way, you let him just kind of kind of be. What's, I mean, in the end, having worked through this, and I know in doing the research for it, must have been extensive. Um, and so you, he's obviously an amalgam of a lot of hackers you've talked to and, and learned about. Now, what's, what's your ultimate kind of feeling about what these guys do? And like how, since they ultimately are going to be part of our world, hacking culture is, is going to be fully part of our 21st century, no matter what laws we pass. How do we learn to live with the, the hacker within the machine from now on yeah. in a better way? Yeah, like like my whole statement with the book is to just like let people know what what it means to be a hacker, right? So you know, I guess this, this is an I, iPad. Yep. Uh, it, just the glass on the iPad and the I, iPhone is is a testament to hacking because right. if you read this the Steve Jobs uh, biography, like they had to almost create that glass specifically for these devices and that that's hacking to me you know like we can we can put label like we can put labels on what the, on the guy who invades your system or uh, or you know there are better words for that like like criminal uh, trespasser like right. like you know, like like hacking it, like every almost everything that we're involved with is is, a, is kind of it falls under the umbrella of what it means to be a hacker in the truest sense so, like, uh, the, the way I formulated the story, I mean, WYSIWYG, it's really a, uh, an acronym, W-Y-S-I-W-Y-G, it stands for what you see is what you get, and that is something I kind of kept in mind the entire time. Like, like, you know, I did catch a little flack about the, the didactic stuff and, like, getting a little soapboxy, but it was actually... Oh, that was it was, but it was, uh, it was done in a specific manner to s sort of be viewed through the lens of how silly hackers perceive mainstream culture right. to as, as as like like their feelings towards the 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 cult, the, the culture yeah. of hacking so so it's like meant to be seen through that lens it's because they do see these things as pure like like the unbelievable whenever there's a sensational piece in the news. Yeah, about. And, and, and I think I think part of what I liked about it is you're kind of saying this isn't how we should respond because this is stupid. Um, so if we're going to kind of think about hacking, and, and I think you're, you, again, you do that history work that you do so well, going back to, you know, you even have this kind of, kind of encounter between Kevin and like Steve Jobs and, and mm -hmm. Wozniak early on, you know, so we can say like Apple computer, the personal computer come, came out of hacking culture too. Everything that we say, you know, defines the 21st century emerges out of that same kind of soup. And so it's... It's not a black and white issue morally. I think the book does a beautiful job with that. And I think, you know, maybe that's, I know we're gonna, I wanna get, make sure we all have time to go into the gallery, so I'm gonna kinda jump ahead just a, a second. But I want to ask you a quick question about, since we're talking about issues of hacking and intellectual property, 
You've been working with Boing Boing for a while. I think that's, and you're still, you're serial, he serialized WYSIWYG on Boing Boing, and, um, uh, which, is a, which is a website that kind of comes out of that hacking culture. It began as a kind of magazine in the 80s uh, early on, and then became a, a website um, kind of for pop culture and uh, kind of digital media culture stuff uh, today. And you're doing hip hop there, you did WYSIWYG there. I, I, I uh, serialized WYSIWYG on my own site. On your own site? Right, right. yeah, it wasn't a part of Oh, it wasn't there, it was no. separate, but you're doing hip hop there. And I, know, and I noticed you kept up WYSIWYG on your own site. It's still available now. Yeah, like, like I just want to uh, distribute the work um, to, in any format that anybody wants to check it out in. Yeah. And I don't want a dollar from a person who's not going to dig the, the stuff. So, like, I just don't, like, I'm not... Your publishers didn't say, please take it down? No, no and, and, like, I think I would even, even, like, go with a different publisher if that, if that was the case. Because it's, yeah. you're serving different audiences, and the person reading it online, like, wouldn't buy a, the book anyhow, I don't think. Or, or, you know, maybe just a percentage of them would. But, um, you know, the, like, the work is what's important to me, and I, and I want the work to get out there, and, and, and to be seen in any way that people want to check it out in. So... The hip hop comic is gonna, like, will will be on Boing Boing until they decide it's not, they well, don't so want it or something right. like that. Um, and then if you want to buy the book, the, so so the the way around that for me is to try to design, like like a really nice to make the book, book worth. Yeah. Yeah, if you're killing trees, like try to try to like make it worthwhile. Yeah. Well, this I mean, one of the things I love about hip hop family trees, you're using the kind of old kind of 70s four color comic style. I mean, you, I want to feel this in paper, so I can't, I can't wait to see it come out this fall. I spent a lot of time uh, trying to, to find the, the, the best paper to, to, to print yeah. the book on, and I found this, uh, this uh, I don't know what you call this, this printer in China that has this really, I mean, because everybody publishes, prints their books through China, you know, um, sad to say, I guess, but, but um, just looking through all these books, I found this great kind of toothy, uh, Kind of ar archival newsprint oh, uh, that's that has some some texture to it and stuff and, and like gave them a call, talked to the fanographics guys. Like we have to get we have to use these guys. We need it on this paper and and the format is going to look like uh, this old Marvel Treasury. Right, that's what that's books, the, yeah that was the, the feeling I got from it. A, a, a big book like in early on in, in the hip hop community, the, the big comic was uh, you know Superman versus Muhammad Ali yeah. because Muhammad Ali won. Right. You know, and, and, and it was it was it was cool. So I wanted to really ca catch that vibe, and and uh, I think hip hop was worthy of a treasury edition when when it was going going on in yeah. the seventies. Well, I want to just I mean I, I grew up I'm you know I'm, like you I grew up in a predominantly African American neighborhood, but unlike you I'm really old. So I was actually um, kind of you know alive during this period and watching kind of Brooklyn change, the sound and the rhythms of the city were changing as we kind of moved from kind of Motown in the beginning of hip hop um, was coming from the Bronx and you know I was there but I was a kid and it was exciting and overwhelming and I was you know I was going through that kind of middle school period where you know race suddenly started to matter more and more and so for me it's been great reading this and like actually getting to kind of understand some of the connections and continuities in this history that I, I kind of grew up with but I mean I, part of me is like thinking okay Ed really is like underground comics that were basically done before he got started. You like early hip hop, you like this hacking culture from the 70s. So you're drawn to this stuff that a lot of it's kind of like bubbling up in the kind of decade or so before you were born. What do what those three things kind of have in common? I mean, there must be some common threads there of interest for you between them. I, they're, they're all like just big influence. So I grew up in, in like, in just a hip hop environment. Um, <laughs> my house was, the nucleus between three parks in town that were that like you could go to any given one and stuff was being the hip hop things were being done if there wasn't like just a couple guys like with a few slabs of little linoleum and, right. a, and a boom box in one park there was a dude that had very rudimentary like like his mom's turntables right. <laughs> doing some stuff in another one so so it was just always there and and like you know I was born in 82 you know I'm most sentient or like first really like remember a lot of stuff by the time I was like maybe five or six. And so, th so that's when guys like had the gaudy jewelry yeah. in town, like the kind of kind of ghetto superstar characters who, yeah. were, who were probably the drug dealers, but they seemed so cool. Yeah. And 
you know, they like they knew the family and everything yeah. because like my grandfather was a cop and um, you know, he I don't know if like money exchange hands here and there, like it was definitely some I mean these guys were coming to the house. Yeah. Um so that I mean, it, it, uh, as a kid, I remember like that movie War Games and with Matthew Broderick with the phone on the right. thing with a computer, and uh, I remember trying to um, trying to get free Coca Cola with by creating like a little slug or like or like taping a quarter you know to a string to try to pull it out and like trick them. So I've always been into subversive things and like knowledge that I'm not supposed to. And were you? Did you get some of your? Did you, were you involved in graffiti culture at all? During yeah, that? it was never that good. Like, and, and also I'm too I'm too much of a, a of a nerd for that stuff. Like, like I found we we went to this one spot where in Pittsburgh where there's you almost just do graffiti for other graffiti artists, kind of off the beaten path. Right. And uh, there was you know we I wasn't really part of a crew. Like a lot of those there's very gang mentality. Like there's like a gang orientation to this stuff where you have your graffiti crews. Right. And there are very few solo guys and. And one of my favorite artists that I would see around town, and nobody knew much about him, like we found him bloody on some train tracks one day because he went over somebody's stuff. And and uh, like I'm I'm not a fighter. I like like I'm not. Right. I sit around drawing all day, and I'm like, you know what, man, I can't. Going back to comics. I can't. I can't. <laughs> I can't hazard this stuff. And 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 honestly, goodness, like that day, um, we like we were painting on the wall, and there were some train tracks, and and. We were idiots because, like, right around it was right around this curve on the train tracks, and this train came by before we had a chance to get on the other side. So we were like up against this wall with the train like right behind us, and like you hear like like little little like pew pew of like these rocks getting thrown around from the train, and I just felt like that was so idiotic, you know. And that was probably like the last real time I I painted where I'm like plaster up against this wall with this long ass train going by yeah. like at top speed because there's no stops uh, like there's no car right. path or, you know like they have nothing to worry about so they could just get all the speed they want and I'm just forget this so, so and so you're doing this is volume one is coming out in, uh, in, in print in the fall how many volumes is it going to be all together because um, it's a it's a big family tree you have <laughs> this is just going to be volume one here right Pretty much, yeah. yeah. And um, and what what I like about this is you you don't know almost any of these people. Like like I mean, there's like unless you're really steeped in right. in the hip hop culture, uh, you like these. Yeah. Are before I started guys. reading it, and I thought I knew something, and my students thought they knew something, and then they were like, "All right, I don't know anything." You know, it's like yeah. It's it's. I mean, part of it is to kind of connect those dots and and, right. and make give a voice to these people that kind of got lost. Yeah, um, it, like I, I don't know how many volumes it's going to be. I, I took a look at my fanographics contract, and <laughs> and they, they, they said, you know, they signed me up initially for five books, and if, if those five books are doing just swimmingly, like they're gonna keep it. I, I mean, I'm going to keep it going, you know, like if with, with or without. So them. you want to keep it going up, kind of bring it up forward? Yeah, I do, but but um, it's good. There's a finite ending. Where where I personally lose interest, and I think a good stopping point would be uh, so around like NWA and Public Enemy. Or beyond that, beyond um, that? Uh, I'd say I'd say the the last episode of of UMTV Raps is probably going to to close the the, the book out because you, you know you would have to go to UMTV Raps for years and years, and that was the place where you would see a rap music video. That was it. Yeah. And you would have you would just have to hope. That the video that you would want to see would be played at in, on this hour, and um, eventually, like rap was on every show right. at any given hour on MTV, so it kind of rendered the show obsolete. So I think that's a good because the book is about the virality or whatever right. of, of the culture. So that's that's a great statement for like okay, hip hop is every like rap right. music is everywhere. Like we don't hip -hop need culture is culture now. Right. Yeah. And that, that issue of virality runs through so much of the work, kind of trying to find a history of things that we now, they're so systemic that we don't think of them as having a history, but they do. It um, it, that sort of stuff just interests me. Yeah, and like, no, like, I, I, I like, you know, I think about um, history of punk rock a lot, yeah. and I, just like the, these niche subcultures too that, that I kind of know a ton about, that's my scheme, it's like I know a ton about this stuff, yeah. and like maybe other cartoonists just aren't exploring that, so that could be like my, like I would have the monopoly on, the computer hacker comics, or and I, I know I gotta let let you go so you can take us back to see the show. But is 
I mean, it sounds to me like then the hip hop family tree is kind of going to dominate your work for for a while now. It could be my life's work. It's so much fun, and I'm having such a good time doing it. And this could be like just just like my contribution and and it's a that, huge contribution. Yeah, like like it's going to take years and years, and you know that's contingent on and just in, my health. In the age of the internet, my students tell me, <laughs> my students say they can go to your hip-hop family tree and then they can go on the internet and look at kind of videos or, or interviews with folks that they never heard of before and it helps them kind of bring it alive because otherwise those things didn't have a context. So it's, it is invaluable work. I got one last question and then I'm going to let you uh, go, which is you are a cartoonist who's totally come of age in the 21st century, right? You are kind of born in this time when a lot of older cartoonists, including you know, many of your heroes, are watching comics change in dramatic ways, probably more than comics have changed at any time in the last, well, at least <coughs> since the birth of the comic book in the 30s. Are you optimistic about the future for comics, or? or? Yeah, I, I think, I, I think they're, they're always going to be around, and, and I've, I'm meeting new and exciting uh, young people who are into it, and, and uh, you know, like, just just to correlate with the hip hop thing, man, there's there's this uh, the the Nas album, Illmatic. At the very beginning, Nas is like, you know, we're doing this stuff even without a record contract, and and uh, and there's a lot of that mentality in comics, where you know you go to these small press shows, and people are just doing it for the for the love of it, and and there's a lot of purity to that, and so it's not going anywhere. And whenever I pose that question at a at a um, convention or something, I I'm uh, slightly dismissive of it because um, I don't think of, and I don't think it's good policy in a lot of ways to uh, to think of yourself as like part of like this comics industry, like as as a creative person within that field or whatever. Because it's almost like we're actually running our own business of, of, right. of, of like this this is this is me and like um, you know. You, it, you can associate it with a big, bigger world of comics or whatever, but you have to kind of like look at, look out for your own, and um, and sort of take care of business yourself. So to to be honest, like like I'm always gonna be here, and and um, and I self published those WYSIWYG books, right. and and like they made me a lot of and a lot of money, and that was just a side yeah. thing that like when you as a normal person are putting in <coughs> your eight hour day at the office or whatever, you. Like come home and you know chill with your family and your loved ones and you know do what you do. Like I finished my, my eight hour day and, and drew WYSIWYG. So it was just a side thing that like sort of caught on. And, and um, so at worst comes to worst. If there are no publishers, I, I'm pretty sure there will still be paper. And I'm still going <laughs> to make books. Yeah, awesome. And I'm still going to figure out ways to do it. So, yeah, like, so and and, I, and and I'm not alone. Like like yeah. everybody I know is of that mentality. So things are strong, things are fine. And just uh, visiting here in Columbus, you know, I've given probably 10 hours worth of talks and workshops and lectures since I've been here. I've only been here for uh, like uh, eight days. And, um, and I'm meeting really, really exciting uh, young, young people, like high school students who are almost like, they're almost out of high school. And they're kind of virtuosos in what they do. I, I see a lot of, uh, prodigious kind of uh, stuff coming from these kids. So I'm excited for them to not have homework to worry about. And I'm excited to, to see them do things. So like this town in particular, all these great young people are coming out of school here and hopefully they stay. Like it, it, it behooves this region for, for these kids to stay just because of all the cool infrastructure in town, comics related. Yeah. Things are moving forward just beautifully and, and, and what, I, what I really <coughs> like is that um, in all of these classes and workshops uh, there's it's I would say predominantly female so there are young yeah. girls in 10th grade talking about love and rockets to me so they're reading good stuff too yeah. it's exciting like I feel so great about it. and that's things. 20 years of comics you got to read to be able to talk about love and rockets too so, yeah no I you make your work and, and talking with you makes me much more optimistic about the future thanks so much for this yeah thank you, thank you.